Hello, this is episode 26 of Tour Talk, and this week I was joined by the awesome Dave Brown sound box from Sum 41. We talk bar fights, uh, crossing borders with paraphernalia on board the bus, and how the band narrowly avoided not only the London bombing, but also being on the flight that took off from Newark on 9-11. Being a Geordie and knowing Dave is a big Newcastle United fan, we had to get into that, and then through no fault of my own, Lamb Curry is once again discussed on the show, as Dave tells us about the time he almost moved to Newcastle and his love for my second favourite Indian restaurant here in town. I asked Dave what it's like for a band having to make the tough decision to cancel the show during the pandemic, we tour quarantine collabs and his first real taste of touring, which bizarrely enough was playing rugby over here in the UK during his teens, and a whole lot more. Oh, and there's a moment of sympathy taken for Justin Bieber, obviously. New episodes of Tour Talk go live every Monday, so please subscribe, comment and like if you enjoy what you hear, and help us spread the word by continuing to share this with anyone you think will enjoy. This is Tour Talk. All right, awesome. Thank you very much for joining us, Dave. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since I've shot one of these, so I thought we might just ease into it. Um, and just get your take on touring. I know it might be a little cruel because it's been a while since you've been on the road and stuff, but yeah. was it always an aim to to end up on the road as much as you guys were? And Oh, it depends. I mean, I, I planned on ending up on the road uh, regardless of whether I was playing guitar or fixing them. And uh, I mean, okay. the the realistic dream was kind of fixing them. And uh, I remember I, I, I got a uh, sit down talking to by a coach out on my uh, rugby team. And he was just kind of like, listen, you're either going to do rugby or you're going to do music. <laughs> so you pick one. And I was like, man, well, I don't know. I don't feel like getting stomped out and just kicked in the shins and cleats down wow. the side of my face. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel like doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I think I'll, I'll choose like fixing guitars. And uh, yeah, I, I ended up just uh, being able to play and ended up in a group where uh, the chemistry really works, which is really, really important because we're all mm -hmm. friends from high school. And yeah, it, it, it just ended up happening, even though it wasn't the, uh, my realistic ambition. It was just kind of like a dream that I had. Oh, so it just it came to fruition and just happened, and not it's almost even better that way, right? Exactly. I I think it it helps me uh, stay a little more humble, even though okay. for for a while back in the day I was I was pretty pretty high on myself. <laughs> well, you guys were you know you exploded and you just did shows nonstop. Was that kind of right? Yeah, man. That that's why I got so much I got so much uh, you know sympathy for Bieber. <laughs> all these people yelling at him when he was like 16 years old it's like man if i was 16 years old with that type of that type of money and power i'd be doing the same thing <laughs> i didn't think we'd get to like sympathy for bieber within a couple of minutes of starting but let's roll with I, it I'm I, fine. I always I'm... make it a go-to just because we're the canadian connection you have to yeah true. you yeah. guys always stick up for you you, you guys exactly. stick up for everybody like you... yeah we'll stick up for celine dion i mean me and bieber have been in a barroom ball brawl protecting celine dion's honor God, I hope that's a real, that's a true story. I wish, I wish. I'd, <laughs> yeah. I'd love to see his moves. Um, so how was it kind of being that busy on the road? I mean, because you guys were doing like a couple of hundred shows a year at one point, weren't you? Or close to yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. It was that's... awesome. I, I mean, yeah. as a musician, you can't, uh, well, I can't. I can't think of anything that would have been better at the time, especially to like hone the ability to be on stage, just like mm -hmm. sharpening your teeth. Uh, nothing. Uh, it was incredible. It was just in a city, in a new city every day, in a van, just, you know, our little like tight, like five person family, sometimes six when we were able to uh, get a guitar tech out on the road with us. Yeah. But I mean, the four of us and our tour manager at the time, Simon Head, we just, it was just this juggernaut of us against the world. And it felt amazing, man. So like the whole, because I mean, I could imagine a lot of people listening to this would think of 200 shows in a year as like a grueling experience. I mean, I'm sure it comes with ups and downs, no matter if you're kind of like riding that crest of a wave with it. Of course, of course. But I, I think if there was more downs than there were ups, I probably mm -hmm. would have just gone to my uh, my original plan A, which was like fixing guitars. It's just go get a steady gig at a, at a music shop and mm -hmm. enjoy life, you know, and, and become one of those crazy like, guitar repair uh individuals that just buys into every conspiracy theory and 
talks what to can... the uh, talks to the consumer like way too long. <laughs> I mean, are you still into that side of things? Do you still kind of like do a lot of good, you know, your own repair work and stuff? All I all I'm really that uh, all I can really do is just like uh, setups, maybe a little bit of uh, minor soldering here and there. But uh, yeah, I'm not bad at setting up. That's for sure. Okay. Just while we're on it, because obviously rugby is a big thing over here too. I'm assuming yeah. you were playing rugby union. I, man, <laughs> I was. <laughs> listen. <laughs> I was at the lowest rung, so there was high school, and then of course I joined the uh, the city club, uh, Ajax mm -hmm. Wanderers, and uh, yeah, it was just yeah, I was the fullback. So, oh wow, okay, yeah, and I don't think I ever broke five eight, but I had a low, <laughs> but I had a low center of gravity, so that was good. And my nickname was Stone Hands, right? So okay. there was there was no future for me in rugby. <laughs> I wasn't no going to say that doesn't sound too complimentary. Nope, 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 nope. It's like a 50% chance of a knock on if yeah. I get the ball kicked to me. Yeah. I mean, for those who don't know, like the fullback's like last line of defense in rugby union too. So if that big guy's coming through, he's aiming for you essentially to yeah. plow straight through you. I was, a, I was an okay tackler. Mm -hmm. I was good at attacking from the side, but I definitely, there was a kid from uh, Port Perry who I think ended up playing national who okay. would just like, his straight arm it just felt like you were running into a moving train <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. a pleasant experience i could imagine dude he straight armed me so hard once my contact lens fell out of my eye wow so... and i'm and i'm sitting there i'm like i can't see and it's just sitting like just above the crest of my uh my wanderers oh, okay. jersey so i see it and i'm like i i'm like oh i can't put this back in coach is like what are you doing what are you doing run i'm like my contact lens he's like put it in your mouth so <laughs> what <laughs> i ended up having my contact lens on my tongue for like it had it what seemed like 30 to 40 minutes man at, wow at least the better part of a half you get that thing back in eventually yeah but it it didn't feel great it didn't mm -hmm. feel great yeah cool so what was it like touring rugby because you came over here for rugby yeah. originally right yeah 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 that that was awesome man we uh we basically did i guess essentially like a preseason tour mm -hmm. and we went to uh hoik we went to cardiff we went to macclesfield and another place but i can't remember uh what you it is so the yeah. sites wow yeah absolutely and like <laughs> went to like had like the full experience in hoik we went to a pub we're all 16 can hardly reach the bar and you know we're like walking home we stole the pint glasses because we were like yeah i guess this is what you do <laughs> so it's me and my billet and we're walking down the street and then all of a sudden all we hear is the whistle right mm -hmm. we turn around and it's like oh shit it's the fuzz no right? <laughs> so <laughs> for a pint glass but i do well we we turn because we were drunk right and yeah. they turn around they grab us. They kind of put us up against the wall, and, and oh, they're just wow. like, "Oh, where are you from?" And I'm like, "Uh, from Canada." They're like, "Do you have your passport?" <laughs> I'm like, "No, it's back at the house." And they just start grilling, and it gets it gets more and more heated, right? As the uh, my billet is just like, "It's just a drink. It's just a drink." They're like, and they're like, "Just a drink, eh, buddy? Just a drink?" <laughs> and they're like in his face, and it's Scotland, so you can see the words and breath just spraying yeah, sure. out onto oh, my billet's face. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, what's this in your hands?" And they're and we're like, "Oh,", oh. and I'm like, "I'm spending the night in jail for doing this." What? I'm like <laughs> questioning everything I've done, and it turns out they were just fucking with us. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like they yeah. were just going to wind you up for sure. <laughs> yeah, they were winding us up real hard. But yeah, we bought into it easily. Yeah, you remember that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> you remember every bit of that. Um, so as a good host, I did a little bit of, um, I did a little prep work for this. And I obviously checked out the the episode of the Heavy Melt Football podcast that you did. Okay. I like, um, literally, as soon as you started, I was like, I was almost gutted because you tell the best anecdote possibly about being on tour um, where you were do, away doing some charity work for War Child and you ended up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, yeah, yeah. Essentially in the middle of a war zone. And I'm like, oh, that would have been such a good story for this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> because what's weird is that a lot of guests like coming on and talking about near-death experiences and actually kind of enjoy reliving those moments. So have we got anything that could come close or can top that story from you? 
Oh, we've died. We've almost died many times, many wow. times. Yeah. Uh, there was, uh, at one point we had, uh, we were coming from a festival. I, th- I can't remember where it was, but we had to cross the Italian border to get back to UK. Mm-hmm. And we were headed to uh, Trafalgar Square, the Trafalgar Hilton there. And um, as we're coming through the border, it was a Swiss border. Sorry, it was a Swiss border. Okay. And uh, we get stopped. And all I hear from across the uh, the bunk alley, you know, behind my guitar text curtain, he's like, mm-hmm. oh, shit. <laughs> right? So I just zap my curtain open. I'm like, mm-hmm. what's going on? What's going on? And he's, he's like, uh, I... I uh, I'm, I'm so fucking high right now. I'm so fucking high. <laughs> right. So we're like, all right, uh, whatever has to happen. Like, do you have anything on you? We, we started like all just kind of going into crisis mode mm-hmm. and he gets stopped. We get detained for like three to four hours. So we're just like, dude, this is fucking eating into our day off. Like, mm-hmm. What, what are we doing? What's happening? So we finally get to the, um, to the, uh, what's it called? The ferry. Oh, and okay. we, uh, go, uh, cross into Dover and we're just all so fucking tired. We, we, mm-hmm. uh, we're so late. The day's like well in. And as we're driving into Trafalgar square, we hear the news from the hotel, they phone and they're just like, uh, listen, there has been an incident. Wow. And uh, we wanted to know if you were OK. The uh, we know the tour bus was supposed to be parked outside of the hotel. Uh, that's kind of where everything went down. And it was the big like uh, Trafalgar underground stop. Uh, wow. bombing. So literally, mm-hmm. like if he didn't get so fucking huh. high and get pulled into customs. Wow. Our our bus would have been parked right outside the, the station and who knows, like maybe broken glass. I don't know. We wouldn't have been hurt seriously, but we would have yeah. been right there. Yeah, wow. man. Wow. I suppose and- at that point you're almost like, quite happy to because <laughs> yeah. the thing the thing is no one really understands those days off are really important on tour when you're on a slog like and you've got a day in London yeah. in your head you're like, I can't wait to get there. I know this bar, we're gonna have a you know, we'll do something <laughs> relaxing, it'll be great. So I can imagine how miserable you guys were on that drive. Well, we turned right back around, went right back to the ferry, and uh, oh, we shit. we went to Aris, France, because that's where the next show was. And unfortunately, that night, actually, it wasn't a near-death experience, but uh, we just decided to drink all day, because we were just like, okay, that that's heavy, like that mm-hmm. something really, really serious could happen there. Yep. And uh, we get to Aris, and everybody is just in the bag, way in the bag. You ever seen somebody search for something like in a bag that we're like at the bottom, like with the cookie crumbs and he, um, our tour manager is just like, okay, everybody into your rooms, uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's go. So two of us, uh, Steve Owen, our drum tech, Dan go into a park, continue of drinking. Course. Derek and Cone go out to a bar and me being the responsible individual I am. I just go back to my hotel room and kind of pass out. Right. I wake up around maybe, I don't know, eight, get some dinner and settle down to a uh, phone call. And, uh, and basically around, I'd say 11, maybe midnight, maybe even later, I get a knock at my door and I'm, you know, I'm talking to my, uh, my wife at the time and I'm like, okay, there's a knock at the door, just one second. So I go look outside and all I see is here to here cone's forehead so i'm like oh sweetheart it's cone i'm i'm gonna let you go i'll call Mm -hmm. you back in a second okay so i hang up the phone open the door and my man's dude my man's tongue is just it dude it's dangling (laughs) like this right it's it's like scissored in half it's just like it's just shaking like 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 a leaf it's just a a leaf about to fall off a tree and he's just Unreal. like and the first thing he says to me is dude we got to bake Derek out of jail <laughs> like what what are you talking about he's like in jail we got to go break him out and i'm like dude first of all wash the blood off of your chin 
mm-hmm. go into my bath. So he washes it off. And like when he comes back in the room, he's kind of got it and he's kind of like trying to hold it onto his tongue. I guess right. he thought like maybe that would help him heal or something like that. Just gonna, yeah, so, just like he's holding it there. Yeah. Fun. And it's not making it any worse. It's like, yeah, Derek and I, uh, we got punched in the face and, uh, and Derek's in jail. And I'm like, wow, there's gotta be more to the story than that. <laughs> and so we show up to catering the next day, Derek gets out of jail. The uh, mayor's daughter was a big fan. Okay. So she was like, daddy, get him out of jail. And he was like, ah, fine. <laughs> So he gets out of jail. He's got like Joker stitches going up the side of his face. Oh shit! Because apparently they got so drunk, and uh, he ended up uh, getting onto somebody's car, jumping up and down. But the problem is, it was the bouncer of the bar. Mm. So in clear view of the bouncer, he's jumping up and down in this dude's car, and he just goes and tries to wind up on Derek. Cone sees what's going on. He tries to grab the the bouncer. The bouncer throws an elbow that severs Cone's tongue pretty much. And then Derek catches one in the face. And uh, all the while, Steve and Dan are in the park lost because they're trying to get home. (laughs) (laughs) And Steve's just like, here's a clearing. Here's a clearing. Dan, let's just fall asleep. Let's just wake up and find our way home tomorrow. (laughs) Sounds like that's a regular occurrence. It was the best. It was the best visit to catering. I don't even remember the meal we had. It was just that good. All the stories that came out. So this was just you guys just sat around and catering over the show, and you're just hearing it all like secondhand. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just kind of all the stories were making sense. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's why. That's why Cone was like, let's go break Derek out of jail. I was like, I get it now. How did the uh, How did the tour manager take that? <laughs> Dude, our tour manager at the time was a guy named Jeff Marshall. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was the coolest and calmest individual I have ever met in my life. On the the uh, the day of 9-11, which is another close call, actually. We were supposed to be on that Newark flight. No. But we ended up staying in, uh, in L.A. because we were supposed to go fly back to uh, New York, do some press, fly back to L.A., mm-hmm. And we ended up staying in L.A. Uh, Our lives were saved because Tenacious D was like, yeah, we'll do that Christmas song with you. Wow. Yeah. So. Wow. That's heavy. (laughs) Right. Really, really lucky. Really lucky. And uh, yeah, he just he's on the phone. It's it's September 11th. And he's just like, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm like, what's going on, Jeff? You never call. Like, what's going on? Like, you never call me. He's like, turn on the fucking TV. I think the world's about to fucking blow up. Wow. And that was the most excited I've ever seen the dude in my entire life. <laughs> but it just came out. <laughs> just, just totally like very, deadpan. Like, yeah, just matter of factly. That's it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's insane. Awesome. Right? Yeah. I mean, so you guys just ended up staying in LA then? I mean, I can imagine the world. Well, yeah. Because if we... you were doing press for a record and stuff, you would have been bouncing all over the place. And I assume that just totally shut down. Yeah, well, this was, uh, we were waiting to actually go and do the uh, a tour with uh, Blink-182, which, by the way, you know, anybody out there, if you can, uh, if you can give to any kind of local cancer society or local, local mm. cancer charity, it, it's a good time to do it. Uh, one of the, one of the pop punk gods is, uh, is, is battling cancer right now. So, yeah. And we, sure. we wish all the best for Mark and, and his family. Yeah, man. But um, yeah, we, we just, we hightailed it back to Canada. Um, Blink ended up uh, canceling the tour, which, uh, which we ended up uh, rebooking and going on. And it kind of caused a little bit of a rift between the two bands because we were oh, supposed okay. to wait and go with them. Mm-hmm. But we were kind of like, well, you know, guys, like we, we need to go and, and do this. And, uh, all of a sudden we started getting asked these questions, like, um, in every interview it was just kind of like, so, uh, our blink 182 chickens. And we were just kind of like, what are you talking about? And yeah. anytime we would, anytime we would kind of sidestep the question, the article would come out and it would just, yeah. You know, you know how like press, kind of yeah. works yeah where it's like uh, if there's if there's no conflict then there's no story right 
It's a shame. We've had a few guests on where they've said they've done like 20, 30 minute interviews with press and the bit that lands is the 20 second snippet that they've cut off half the sentence just to get a, a headline and a story <laughs> out of it and totally yeah. twist it. It's like, I don't, yeah, I don't see how there's, there's a career in that for journalists to do that. Like, it's unfortunate, man. But I mean, you know what I do actually like? Um, after taking about nine years off of the band and coming back mm-hmm. to the the atmosphere the press is now, it's a lot more about uh, getting a story than creating a story. Okay. Yeah. Which which, which I I which I don't know. I maybe maybe we're just like elder statesmen now, and <laughs> there's a little more. No, I mean you guys were so young at the time anyway that you're still young now. Like you've got loads of time. <laughs> you're fine. Dude, I just turned forty one. Just turned forty one. <laughs> Killing it. <laughs> Oh, good. So did you guys, get, I mean, did you want to fly after that? I mean, did you, I know you, you said you went back to Canada, but did you stick around for a while? I mean, I can imagine that being a really weird time we, to want to do anything. We were obviously, we were nervous, but we mm-hmm. were also, like you said, we were really young. So we didn't really have anything. I don't know. All our affairs were in order. If, if anything, um, wow. because at the time you have to understand this is so many years ago for some people listening. Mm-hmm. Um, when this happened, when the towers fell, every single person was like, it's world war three. The world is yep. about to end. Like this is, this is it because it was just such a traumatic and awful, awful thing for, you know, North America to go through. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So we, we were just hesitant, but we knew that it was the best thing for us to move forward. Uh, as far as like, you know, the, the old cliche, like seizing the day, like you yeah. have to, if opportunities there, grab it by the fucking neck and drag mm-hmm. it. You know what I mean? That's, that's just how it, how it has to go. And things might've been different if we didn't go on that tour, if, if we didn't go and, and uh, play some shows for some people who were in need of a show at that point. Yeah. I mean, especially with this industry that if you're on that crest, like it's so hard to get there in the first place. Like I, you have to try and ride it out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, man. That first, that first impression is everything, right? Yep. For sure. Yeah, man. I am. Um, so, I mean, it's been at least 18 months for you since you've, you've been on tour. I mean, I know you've managed to keep yourself pretty busy during all of this with the collabs and the cameo stuff that you've been doing for charity and the, it was the 15 second riffs thing. And I even saw did shaving you do every day. I've been shaving every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shaving's overrated, man. Like we do it because we have to occasionally. Like, your mom's no, like, you look, you look messy, man. You need to sort yourself. It's like, okay, fine. I'll shave. But that's literally for, it. For real, what's going on? I'm, I'm going, I'm taking my fiance out for her uh, birthday weekend. Mm-hmm. And I was just, it's just been days and days of planning and being like, ah, you know what? I'll just cut my hair tomorrow. Cause I cut my own hair. <laughs> oh, As wow. you can see from press photos, I, <laughs> like if you look a little closer, you'll be like, oh yeah, he cuts his own hair. That's like, I tried doing it during lockdown, but I couldn't do the back. Like I was just shaving, completely shaving the sides, but the back getting that line it's just dangerous it Dude, was, use it was your, borderline use your ipad or use was, a mirror i was trying man i was trying i just <laughs> haven't got the skills like you i just need maybe i could do a lesson we could do a whole thing on it like how to cut your own hair during pandemics listen i'm, I'm not fading or anything it's literally <laughs> just like a one and a half around yep. and then yeah like peaky blinder style it's cool Looks cool yeah oh, thanks um, thanks so have you got a, like, out of all the stuff that's kept you busy, have you got a highlight of, of the stuff that you've done? Has there been a... Man, the the covers. Working yeah. with musicians that I wouldn't normally get to work with. Um, you know, uh, one of the first ones we did was a uh, new wave of British heavy metal mm-hmm. medley. And uh, Tom and I got to work with uh, Gene from from uh, Hank Von Hell's uh, band and, you know, Charlie from Anthrax which was huge. And, uh, you know, Danko is like a, a, a legend around Toronto. Yep. Right. And, and also he's like the Hoff in Germany too. Right. He's like the rock and roll Hoff. <laughs> is that for sure? Is that real? Dude, man. All I know <laughs> is that, uh, I've been wanting to work with Danko for a while and I got to work with him on two songs and, uh, Amazing. it's, yeah, it's just been a friendship that's been kind of building to this thing where we finally got to work together and dude, Mickey from motorhead. And yep, that's a pretty oh, cool thing dude. to do. And even Hank himself on a, on a pill cover, like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just oh, such a good, good, uh, good experiences. And then we got to work with some good friends from the used, Bert and Jeff, uh, Frank and I. And cool. uh, yeah, man, it's been great. So for me, I spent a lot of time like trying to get 
musicians in like the same room at the same time and it's not the easiest thing in the world yeah. how was organizing these collabs did you guys did you finally feel like our pain of like what it's like trying to get you guys to do stuff i'm one of those musicians so it'll always be <laughs> it'll always be like hey man do you have your do you have your video and your track done yet oh no not yet man i've been uh you know i've been working construction I'm like ah cool man whatever <laughs> there's no, <laughs> it's no there's always like and i'm the same way it's just like hey man did you uh did you finish those guitar tracks and i'm like ah you know what i i i'm trying my best but i'm also trying to you know keep the weight down for when i do get back out on tour so i don't walk mm -hmm. out like Elvis in fucking at the Hawaii the, the sure punch bowl or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be hard getting everything together, but mm -hmm. um, if you take a relaxed approach, especially with musicians, um, they tend to take advantage of it. And uh, that's why it's been <laughs> about maybe two or three months since the last one that I've done. <laughs> Have you got stuff sitting in the can that you just can't get finished or well, no, actually, we're almost done. Um, a guy named Steve Kiley from a band named uh, Monster Truck. Mm -hmm. uh, he kind of put together this lineup. I brought in Gene again because Gene and I do a lot of stuff together. Uh, and we, we worked with Don Airy from uh, Oh, wow. From Deep Purple. Yeah. Deep Purple, yeah. <laughs> what a we, we were just like we did a cover of Stay Away by the Meters. Wow. And uh, we were just like, you know, we should we should probably leave Don some space to, to go off. Yeah. And, and dude, it, he is, he is unreal good. Yep. Just how beautiful these lines flow, how he just took blues, funk and metal and applied it to a meter song. It, it's brilliant. And then, yeah, uh, twist a cane uh, with uh, Chuck Garrick and uh, Jess from uh, CKY. What? Cool. When, so right. when's that going to be done? <laughs> just, just waiting on him. Just wait. It's just, just waiting. The, yeah, we're on musician time, which is, which is like an hour behind Caribbean time. <laughs> yeah. Which doesn't really have a time at all. It just floats no, around the ether, just, doesn't yeah, it? It's just, yeah. What time is it? It's whenever. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> oh man. Um, has it been enough to like make up for not being on the road? No. All these little no. No, no, no. There's, there's no substitute for being on the road. It's just whether, um, whether my mindset that day or whether I can get out of the, the mindset of missing the road. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just occupying your time. Uh, I'm really thankful for the past two years because I got into a relationship uh, pretty much right around the time, uh, right before I got in, back into Sum 41. Mm -hmm. And we'd maybe spent like six months together. And then all of a sudden I was back out on the road and we, so I would see her from week to week, uh, you know, yep. for three years or five years. Yeah. Five years. Wow. And then all of a sudden I'm home for two and she's like, she's got to deal with me home all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and uh, because of these two years, um, I also missed a lot of time with my stepkids. And I've gotten to spend a lot more time with them, become a lot more close. And uh, yeah, man, just like you. Awesome. Yeah, being a being a step parent can be a weird dynamic. Mm -hmm. But when you're home for like a week or two at a time, it's like the strange it's the strangest thing. But but um, there's no lack of love. It's just mm -hmm. you got to know when yeah. to yeah when to be a dad and when to let their actual dad be the dad you know sure. yeah so are they ready for you to go back out on the road yeah yeah <laughs> they're like this dude this dude snores <laughs> he jams along to megadeth way too loud his studio's right underneath my room and you know like he's he thinks he's better at fifa than he actually is <laughs> <laughs> do they beat you I'm sure if if my if my stepson put in a couple weeks and if my stepdaughter put in two and a half weeks, they'd be better than me. Wow. And Who she's never play? played she's never played FIFA in their life. <laughs> so But they just growing up with iPads and stuff. It's a totally different world for them. It's like we don't stand a chance anymore. Dude, I I watched him play in Rocket League the other day and he's like <laughs> he's like 
yeah yeah i'm like what are you doing They're like what, what's happening is, is the game glitching he's like no 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 i'm like uh i'm learning how to dribble on on the roof of the dome <laughs> there's just no fear right there's just like <laughs> yeah. nothing's like impossible why like, not yeah and then he <laughs> yeah he's just like we got him a gaming pc and i kind of guided him through the uh the getting started this and that mm-hmm. and now he's just like he's able to apply clients applications this and that mods he's like he's getting really slick so So, yeah and my stepdaughter is just fully like one of the most brilliant human beings just absolutely academically sound which lets you know that she is not part of my bloodline (laughs) (laughs) you must have done okay in some things yeah. yeah yeah i did i was okay at like when i left high school that was when i did okay but when i was in high school i was fucking terrible at it <laughs> yeah what just like the anti-establishment thing or just didn't a lot enjoy of that the atmosphere? a lot of arrogance towards teachers mm-hmm. a lot of me um putting the blame on them okay. besides besides putting the blame on me which represents kind of like an outlook of being like uh, feeling like the world revolves around oneself. Mm -hmm. And once I got out of that mindset, I was just kind of like, wow, I could have done a lot better in high school if I just thought this way. But yeah. So at least you'd learn it and you get to pass that on, which is the important thing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see. We'll see. So I got to ask, obviously like being a Geordie too, do you always play as Newcastle when you're playing FIFA? Oh, of course. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I started okay. I started a career um, maybe two weeks ago. Okay, and uh, like a newer career, I, I'm in 21, and and uh, I must have sat there. It must have been at least 10 minutes, because I was like, oh, you know what? Uh, maybe I'll just. What if I just put him down? <laughs> maybe third tier, and I'll just play him up. Because my my goal was like to take a low a low rung team and it. just bring them into the premier, and yep. I was just like, oh, but I oh, I'm so I'm so loyal. Ah. <laughs> and then I just ended up playing as Newcastle. Man, and, I've, it's, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just like especially for us, like because Newcastle never win anything, and it is a miserable existence. Getting to at least live the team winning something yeah. <laughs> through FIFA oh, football manager is a massive experience. <laughs> I have so many Newcastle careers going. I have one where I built a team around Joe Wellington. Wow. Why? <laughs> Just because, because I'm telling you this right now. I'm telling you this right now. Joe Wellington as a, as a uh, kind of like mid lying, not exactly a cam, but a okay. center mid, you know, maybe, uh, you know, kind of like what, if uh, if he kind of had the passing passing skills of Shelby, uh-huh. he's got the speed and the physicality to play the role that Shelby's role represents in the modern game. But Shelby's kind of like a he's an old school center mid, right? Yeah, but he runs less than any other. Yeah, but, but that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, know, I know what you mean. But he was just kind of like one of those like standstill playmakers. Yeah. Yep. Completely. Right. And and yeah, like he can. I mean. Say what you will about John Joe Shelby. Like, you see, okay, dude, this is a testament to how, like, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't, <laughs> I can't be on one of the players. I just like, <laughs> look at I'm you, look, like, I can oh, see the agony in your yeah. face. Like, you're just, <laughs> just, I've got to save this somehow. I've got to be yeah, nice I about do, him. I could do this. I do, because I don't know. I still have a soft spot for him, man. I know he doesn't run. I know, I know. He's that, a fantastic footballer. I think that's where the frustration comes from, that sometimes you see the things he does and it's like, you could be a top level Premier League player, but for some reason, there is not that consistency throughout where like, he should be scoring six, eight, 10 goals a season. He should be getting six, eight, 10 assists as well. Like he is, can be that good. If, if the, uh, if the modern central attacking midfielders didn't have to be so mobile, Mm -hmm. he would be a murderer in that spot that's how i feel it's he's just in the wrong generation it's not his fault pretty much i mean if you have him centrally sitting there you know just Mm -hmm. just in between uh half and the box it's like anybody could spray something to him and he's quick enough uh with the pass to one touch it to somebody 
he just needs to be in a good team that has a lot of the ball, and then he'd be fine. But unfortunately, Dude, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. But I mean, Steve Bruce's system. Even though I'm not a huge fan of Steve Bruce, um, the way Steve Bruce plays with the the old school kind of football, mm-hmm. he fits kind of he fits well into that system. Yeah. But I feel like if somebody comes in and plays a more modern style of football, which is what the club needs, uh, he better hit that treadmill. <laughs> yeah. He hit it here. Yeah. I, Me- meanwhile, I'm saying this and, you know, if, you know, I bet you if he crossed the ball to me, like, Oh, it would it would just that. it would shatter my skull or my chest yeah. or yeah exactly and he could probably outrun us as well like no yeah, problem for real. like yeah he could no, probably I'm, do like I'm, a 10k in like 20 30 minutes it'd be fine like we'd just yeah. be like dying at the side i'm not beating john joe i'm gonna owe him no. a beer at the end of the sprint that's for sure, sure. Um, yeah but joe linton's the one huh from well i Dublin's. okay this is i'm just saying this is how much career mode i've played <laughs> you made joe like, linton you know good yeah i was like i'll just build a team around joe linton this time wow yeah and yeah, he did pretty well. He did pretty well. Well, maybe I'll try it too. We'll see if that's a thing. Dude, different challenges. You know, that mm-hmm. you get that's how you keep yourself busy when you got two years off work. Man. So like I was when I was sixteen, I actually worked at St. James's Park. Like I used to work in the, oh, like, nice. the catering suites and stuff. Um because basically you would work before the game at half time and then after the game. But because everybody was out watching the match, you could watch the match too. So I just, oh, I got to yeah. see like every home game for like two years. You actually got the food that the other people were eating, like whatever was left over. So my little Saturday job was like oh, the best the... job. Like sixteen to <laughs> eighteen was. That's awesome. That's the way to do it. That's all. Awesome. Um, I, I I was almost living in Newcastle for a while. Uh, wow. Uh, my ex had uh, moved to Jesmond, and oh, wow, uh, I live we, in Jesmond we... too. Oh, nice. Yeah, we were still yeah. together at the time. Yeah, we were we were right by the uh, the Dabba Wall. Oh really? What did you think, dude? I I love Dabawal. The, their uh, lamb biryani, amazing. their lamb biryani was one of my favorite favorite things. And then my uh, my favorite uh, like spirits bar was uh, the botanist. Is that still oh, wow. around? Okay, yeah, yeah. The botanist is still there. Ah, oh, dude, yeah. That was a, wow. was a good bar. Yeah. It's funny we've discussed curry quite regularly on this podcast, and lamb <laughs> is for me the test. Like if if you can cook lamb right in a curry yeah. and you get it right, then that's that's it i'm i'm yours i'm done well dude here's the secret have you ever cooked lamb slow is i just slow, have to cook it slow but also you have to um you have to flour the meat mm-hmm. okay right let it sit and the flour will draw out most of the gamey blood okay right and then wash the meat and then cook it wow yeah you got an old you got a lamb speciality there that's a that's a that's a trick from my dad. So he used he does the same thing with lamb that he does with goat when he does curries. Okay. Yeah. Oh man, I bet that's I bet he's is he killer? Is his food oh, awesome? <laughs> dude, his he had a neighborhood that he grew up in, like the countryside in Guyana. And mm-hmm. there was a dude that ended up moving to Ajax and starting a restaurant who took all the kids and was just kind of like, I'm gonna teach you how to cook to keep you off the streets. The keeping them off the streets thing didn't really work, but he made a lot of really good cooks come out of that uh, that village. Wow! So has yeah, he passed man. it on? Are you are you making it too? In his way, he passed it on, but like <laughs> he's the kind of guy who's like, "All right, look in the pot," and I'm like, "All right." So I, I look in the pot. He's like, "That's what you want." <laughs> 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 yeah it's like my dad's persian and he's an amazing yeah. cook too and it's kind of like it's just different every time and like so there is no method to it. it's like dad i'm trying to learn he's like well i just put carrots in it this time i was like well, but why he's like because i felt like it i was like well, yeah <laughs> just <laughs> I, I, I just don't have that innate ability just to be like oh yeah this will work with carrots no problem yeah it just needs a little bit more chili and be fine oh some red wine today why not why not? Right. I, you know, I, th- but there's those, but then there's those little like nuggets of wisdom. Like I, I think the, the best thing he ever taught me was like, um, fry the onions in oil. Don't boil them. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. And then and that it. just like all of a sudden woke, it woke up my curry. So is that a big thing for you on tour food and trying stuff out when you go to different places? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tom, I think, Tom and I are the most uh, 
adventurous. I love finding like those cheap yeah. kind of mom and pop spots. So I'll, sometimes I'll, I'll look it up. Sometimes I'll just go for a walk and, and step into a place and yeah, man, like it, it's a, it's a good part of kind of uh, learning a little bit more about the people in the mm -hmm. city that you're, you're staying in. And uh, as opposed to just like um, going to a castle and then calling it a day and getting room service. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was weird for me because I could imagine what it would be like touring back in the 70s where you go into places and nothing's changed. So they're like indicative of what they've always been like. Whereas now when I the first time I went to Tokyo, the first coffee shop I saw was a Starbucks. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I mean, that's cool and everything. But like, but, can you imagine what that would have been like 20, 30, 40 years ago? Would, well, it's just like the Wild West out there. Yeah. So as much as yeah. I've loved traveling and seeing stuff, like I kind of feel like a little, oh... Uh, I, I actually got reminded of, of my first trip to Japan because uh, on a walk, I, uh, I was kind of the streets were kind of filled by this musician that was playing his flute. And I was in line okay. for blood work today and there's a retirement home behind the clinic. So I'm outside days all sunny. A lot of people are complaining about the line, but like in the distance, you can kind of hear like this dude playing a flute. And I was like, oh, oh wow. man, this is this is pretty <laughs> rad. So, yeah, that's some that's some place. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, how much time yeah, did you get to spend there? I was only there for like a couple of days. We basically flew in to do a couple of shows and then straight back out. So we got a day either side, more or less. But just walking around Tokyo was just especially being sleep deprived and maybe a little yeah. hungover from parts of the flight and you're just like yeah. my senses can't handle all of this there's a lot of input Dude, when you're walking around tokyo it's like if you to, going to tokyo is like if you took like a caveman and gave a caveman mm -hmm. a cell phone yeah that's the amount of like you turn the brightness on like a million yeah yeah and just and there is something <laughs> to look at every single degree yep of angle that you can look yeah no it's an awesome place um yeah, man. that's cool so i know that you guys had a show planned for next month but from what i understand today unfortunately that that's been pulled the, the slam dunk festival that you guys were going to come over and do in the uk yeah so the, the announcement went live today eh? yeah that's right yeah oh, um and it was just like i think a lot of people who listen to this we try and educate them as much about the industry as we can um mm -hmm. and it would be cool to if you're if you're all right with it getting a reaction on that and like what actually goes into those decisions because it's not easy like one trying to fact during all of this trying to factor a transatlantic trip and then actually trying to make the decision to that you can't you can't make it for whatever reason yeah it's it's impossible to really just put into a uh a single thought Mm -hmm. but for us playing live is the most important thing mm -hmm. and when something comes along that trumps that thought and that bravado that we get from living that way yep it's shitty man it, it sucks and it hurts and of course decisions like that they get poured over and poured over and poured over and in the end, the decisions are what they are. And, you know, we'll, it's, it's not the last time that we'll ever be in the UK, yeah. but uh, for all of us, it's something that we were looking forward to like a lot. Um, yeah, I can for imagine. Me, it, for me, it was kind of like a signal to getting back to what my regular life is. Mm -hmm. So I remember I was, uh, Actually, it was my birthday weekend. Uh, we were in Toronto and uh, I got the text from Frank and he was just kind of like, yeah, it looks like um, it looks like this isn't happening. And I was just in oh, shock. Shit. I was just gutted. It took me a little a little bit to uh, to kind of look around my my surroundings, realize like, OK, you know, you're you're out here to celebrate you know, another year yeah. of existence. So, you know, try to find the the silver lining in that. It's, I think it's because, especially for us and the people working in the industry, it's been trying to have that one little light at the end of the tunnel that you're at least working towards or because yeah. it's not been easy. And it, I think having at least something to 
there in the future that you know that there's something planned and it's going to happen is has been quite important for mental health for all of us i think and then yeah having to ride these changes and having a show booked and then having it rescheduled um i think it's been it's been tough for a lot of people and it, i can imagine it wasn't an easy decision to to have to pull that show and not just to for the fans but for yourselves as well because i can imagine it was something that you were all looking forward to doing oh yeah absolutely yeah i mean as soon as as soon as the news kind of hit uh i mean frank and i were texting but then the group chat just kind of lit mm -hmm. up and it was like it was like uh, i guess we'll you know i guess we'll have to to wait until until march until we see each other again wow yeah so I feel like a bummed you out. Yeah, it, it's it's it is it's a it's a major major bummer. And I mean, I, I'm not one of those people that can just be like, oh, we'll get through it. Yeah, no, but, man. I mean, it's because it it's, matters. Yeah. You care. Yeah, like, it's absolutely. This, yeah, this is that. yeah, this is my life. This is this is how you know I. This is my main connection with people, and and mm -hmm. the uh, the the touring atmosphere is where. You know, I've spent the better part of my life now. So, yeah. What's the band's group chat like? Uh, <laughs> is it because some people's group chats are pretty funny? Some are quite yeah work related, serious. Are you guys? Uh... I would say it leans more towards um, uh, just like sharing like news mm -hmm. and how each other's doing. We tell each other we we miss each other a lot, stuff like that. Yeah, and. Uh, but there's no like there's some group chats i've seen like uh my uh a close person to me uh has a group chat with some friends and it's just like what <laughs> lists <laughs> what lists are you guys on because this is fucking just shady shit <laughs> I just there's always one person in a group chat like no matter what it was sending it's like where do you find this shit like it's unreal yeah, yeah. like like what what deep dark cave of reddit it's in, yeah do, it's incredible you i mean cover this from i mean especially because when the euros were happening over here i don't know how much of it you watched but a lot yeah and it was an amazing tournament and england did really well to get to the final and it was just such a shame that the aftermath of that was was a mess um yeah yeah really i mean because even though we didn't win, that month of being here was amazing. And it was that little yeah, bit of normality. Dude. And it was such a ride. And then to have that straight after was such a shame. Um, but I'd be like in group chats and like this stuff would be coming up of like, did you see any of this stuff when the Scotland fans were in London? And there yeah, were these videos saw, of like... Uh, I saw a little bit of happening. that. And I, like, saw, I saw some of the, the comments being posted to the poor kids' Instagram. And yeah. You know what? Like, th it's kind of like how I was defending players before. Mm -hmm. Dude, if he had a second chance, you know he would have put it away. Yeah. You know what I mean? But half the people writing those comments couldn't even reach the net. No. It's from the spot. You know what I mean? And would just, they, it, the shot of them walking to the, to the penalty spot would yeah. be them just walking out of the stadium because they couldn't handle the pressure. Yeah, completely. You know, and you know, it's a it's a kick. You know, it, it's it and unfortunately that that is the uh like the the sharp edge of sports. It's like you know, staying alive comes down to one kick. Yeah. Which is why it's so like it's live theater essentially. That's why it's entertaining. Yeah. It's because there's tension on that one thing and for someone to be brave enough to kind of get up and do that and then have to experience what they did afterwards is just yeah it's yeah just and horrific but i mean you also if you look on the other side i mean i was kind of a neutral through the whole thing because i mm -hmm. mean i've got family in england and i've got people that I, that I consider family in italy so it was just it was like i'm gutted yep. on this side and it was just adulation like geo man like come on <laughs> that's 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 an incredible career moment for that guy yeah and uh yeah i think that um the the reaction to the loss uh kind of overshadowed how um how underrated the talent on italy was yeah i mean i think they had an amazing tournament i think they were the best team throughout and i think we would have had to have some game to have, to have beat them in the final yeah um, but dude all they needed for the past, what, like, it's got to be like 
four, no, it'd be three tournaments. They just needed Chiro to just click. Mm -hmm. And he finally did. He finally did. He, he, uh, he scored a lot of goals this tournament. Yeah, they were great. Um, I suppose while we're on football, I should segue to Paul. Um, so I've been really <laughs> lucky that when I've been doing this podcast that friends have helped me out and they've introduced me to people. And obviously the reason that you're here is that Paul Hamilton is like, was the link between us for you to kind of hook up this show. And I've never worked with Paul on tour. Um, yeah. But I can only imagine that he's like what you would refer to as a, a good tourer. And he is like an amazing person to have around. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The two of us kind of just formed a, uh, a friendship over uh, Newcastle United. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, I heard the accent. I was like, oh, dude, Newcastle. He's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started talking about it, started talking about the team. And then, you know, we watched a couple games every now and then. We actually went to, uh, we were in Switzerland and we went to a Canadian pub okay. and watched the Newcastle game, watched them lose, of course, of course. but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was, it was just funny. Cause he was just kind of like, what do you think of all this stuff going on here? Like in this pub, there's just like a moose, like a stuffed <laughs> moose hanging on the walls, just all this like canadian cliche, stuff. canadian yeah stuff, and right? i was just kind of like ah, it's kind of funny it's kind of funny i'm like i wonder what he would think about all the like the diehard like british pubs in canada because i mean <laughs> whether you're irish italian you know like whatever part of of uk europe you are from mm -hmm. when you come over to that section in toronto you were like holy shit this is my home country in overdrive this is yep. too much like this is way too much <laughs> people are doing a lot to show their their irish pride their english yeah. pride stuff like that i just remember going to an irish pub in germany and they all had irish accents i was like this can't be real they can't have just found the only irish people in frankfurt to work here and they hadn't. They were all German who had learned how to speak English with an Irish accent to work in that pub. It was no crazy. Way. Seriously. Yep. That hundred percent. Yeah, that's a that's a recruiter post if if any. Yeah. I, I was you have to speak with an Irish accent or you can't work <laughs> here. But I, we because there was three of us, and we were like, are they Irish? Is that like we were fooled? Genuinely yeah. fooled. And we've met enough Irish people to hopefully we should have known better. Imagine being the one person that needs a job at that place. <laughs> the one's like, well, how am I going to learn to speak with an Irish accent if you don't <laughs> let me work here? <laughs> Too right. Um, but so having a personality like that on tour, like how important is that? Because touring can be grueling. There are a lot of ups and downs. You've got to yeah. make the most of your days off. And having people around who are, good fun to be around and have that kind of positive vibe i can imagine like doing this some of the stretches you guys have done that that's almost as important if not more important than anything else really yeah i mean we're back at a place uh where everyone that we work with um mm -hmm. and because i mean dude paul was a big void to fill once he uh he ended up getting uh gigs that could pay him a bit more and could yep. keep him working longer and it, um, there was a group that we had and everybody kind of split off and it was heartbreaking mm -hmm. and it took a while to get that kind of, of, uh, good energy all around the stage back. Yeah. And, you know, between, um, between Greg, Nick, Ben, Yoshi, you know, Matt, like everybody. And most of the time, Stuart, we get Stuart a, uh, a like a, one of the most amazing businessman slash merch guys <laughs> I've ever met just like always a joy to be around, but like that kind of like tight knit family atmosphere is really, mm -hmm. really hard to, um, to create, especially with the, uh, the budget that we're working with. And, you know, to have that, it's like, man, it's, it's unbelievable. And every single yeah. person plays their part in making this essentially like if you think of things as a biodome as as uh you know how isolating it can be mm -hmm. to be this like 10 to 12 person party you know what i mean like it yeah. 
yeah, it's a lot. And we're, you know, we're, we're missing a uh, member of our family who chose to uh, kind of start her business in, in California and, oh, wow. and she's doing really, really well. But uh, yeah, D- Jeanette Steiner is, is missed on the road a lot. Mm. Is that Stuart who works with Anthrax as well? Hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. If, if he's ever betting on football, bet on what he's betting on. For real. Yeah. Dude. Did Hamilton ever tell you about the time we went to go see uh, Champions League uh, Bayern versus Arsenal? No, but I think you mentioned it in the the other podcast, and I had yeah. unbelievable, yeah, dude, I couldn't believe it. He, <laughs> he's like, he's like, I put this, uh, I put some money down on uh, Lewandowski. I'm like, oh yeah, what, what for? He's like, uh, hat trick, a penalty kick, and a header. I don't know if it comes in, you know, yep. it, it, there and. Dude, sure enough, 5-2 Bayern, and the header goes in, the penalty kick goes in, and then he gets a hat trick. Unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Everyone's and, got that one friend, though. Yeah, yeah but, absolutely. But, dude, he did it in front of his girl at the time, too. <laughs> so he must have just, like, he must, yeah, like, he must have gone back to the hotel, and she was like, listen... I got these chocolate covered strawberries for you. <laughs> you are a special human being. So yeah. here you go. Yeah. Um, I had a friend when I was working at St. James's, um, we were playing Spurs at home. And I don't know if you remember, it was that game with Lauren Robert scored two of the most ridiculous yes. goals I've ever yeah. seen. I saw him before the game in the corridor and he was like, Oh, I've, I've put, I put 10 pound on your castle to win four nil and Robert scored the first goal. I was like, you're insane. You're absolutely insane. And then lo wow. and behold, like, I mean, I, there's something about like left-sided French players who turn up at Newcastle, but they're, they're just so mercurial and enigmatic. They, there is something right. weird about how that keeps happening. Also, though, Stuart, he's been around a long time. And, you know, FIFA did get busted for match fixing. <laughs> and Stuart's got a lot of connections. I, I really wouldn't be surprised if, like, you know, cut to, like, 1982, you know, Stuart and <laughs> Seb Blatter are in a drinking competition, like in fucking Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> the very beginning, just in the mountains Stuart of Nepal. Won drink- yeah. <laughs> yeah, Stuart won that drinking competition. Yeah, there. exactly. And he's yeah. like, if I win this drinking competition, you are going to let me know when you become the head of FIFA, which matches the battle. <laughs> Shit, we've, we've exposed him, though. This wasn't meant to be like an expose podcast, but hey. hey. That's that's hey. cons- that's how easy conspiracy theory is to believe today. Yep. Like, all you Blab gotta do mouth, is like, yeah. All you gotta do is put it out there, no matter yep. how much bullshit it's laden with. Yeah. Has there ever been a, a story that's popped out about you or something that's like just total shit? And it's just like, how has this even become a thing? Oh, I heard one. I heard one yesterday. It wasn't too crazy. Uh, I was that I. Uh, got kicked out of high school it's like no if you know if you knew me you're like you know I, i'm never the type of kid that would get kicked out of high school too respectful too mm-hmm. too nice but I'm trying to think like you know what there's a factor fiction that we did with tal from loudwire right okay that'll probably give you a better uh a better <laughs> description of of uh of that answer but i can't think of anything off the top of my head no worries um who does it? Who sits at home and makes that hit today? You know what? There's something about Dave from some 41. Maybe I'll just, uh, he got kicked out of high school. Fuck it. I'm just going to put it out there and see what happens. Dude, it's the fucking guy that didn't, it's the, the guy that didn't get the job at the German pub because <laughs> yes, he can't speak dude. with an Irish accent. He's just sitting there. He's like, man, fuck. <laughs> just, oh. And then all of a sudden spouts out some Alex Jones shit. And that becomes and his his vehicle to uh, to fame, right? Fuck, yeah, that guy, that guy. Yeah, um, I heard his name was Q. <laughs> so, I mean, just to kind of to kind of wrap up the whole touring thing, is there is there any like a one thing that you really miss about being on the road above all of the things? Like, some people really like their bunks. Some people really like. <laughs> do you know? Is there like is there one thing that has been missing for the last couple of years? The one thing, if I could say this, is just I miss everything. Okay. You know, my touring family, you know, playing my guitar, getting sharper at guitar, the 
food, the travel, the downs, the ups, everything that mm -hmm. is uh, everything that's in it, it just I miss everything. Because it is a it is a lifestyle essentially. It's a lifestyle choice, isn't it? To to yeah. be in a band, live on the road, and and all and the I've things been, that go with it. Yeah, and I've been conditioned to do that since I was seventeen years old. Mm -hmm. So you know, for literally the better part of my life, I've been a musician that has been playing shows and and on the road. So I am, although I can do normal human tasks like laundry and cutting the lawn, <laughs> I, I mean. I it would, I'm a very, my talent is very niche and it's uh, very specific. So I, there's not a lot that I can do outside of, of, uh, you know, <laughs> what I've achieved. But at least you did it really well. Yeah. <laughs> at least we you like yeah. hammered that one home. Like, yeah. You mediocre. <laughs> in, yeah. If, if I were a steak, it'd be mediocre. Well, no, I think, yeah. you, I think you've, done, <laughs> you've pretty well done, Dave. I think you've done. Okay. Um, it's been awesome to chat to you, man. Thank you very much for giving us some time. It's, oh, it's been man. a really cool chat. Anytime you want to do this, just let me know. Yeah, even if uh, even if there's no cameras. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, absolutely. I mean, I'm hoping that one day, like, we all get back to it and we can do it in person at times and, like, actually go to shows and see people at gigs and, like, just hang out and have a chat about life and the world and stuff. It is definitely part right? of it that I really yeah. miss. I think, luckily for me, doing this has actually helped keep me a little sane during it, so... Oh. My man, I did one yesterday with a, a great guitar player uh, um, and bass player, plays with Slash, and I was just having one of those days where I was saying, like, my mindset, I just woke up, looked at a video of um, of the economy in Lebanon, and that's the kind of stuff that comes up <laughs> in my YouTube feed, <laughs> and... I, wow. I'm not laughing at the plight or anything like that, but it just put my head in a space where it's just like, oh, if I just was back on the road, I could help somehow if I could, you know, and mm -hmm. it just starts spiraling down. But then all of a sudden, just a little bit of a little, little bit of like social and and uh, vibrant interaction just makes everybody better, man. It helps. It helps. Yeah. Hopefully, that's that's what we're going to get back to doing at some point soon. Well, yeah, we'll do the next one at the botanist. For sure. Whenever you're here, yeah. just let me know. I'm I'm <laughs> okay. there. I'm Sounds there. Good. I'll be propping that bar up. I mean, I'm not very tall either, but I'll like be trying. Yeah, I'm dress nice. I'm gonna dress nice. Oh, okay. It's one of those. All right. Yeah, it's gonna be one of those. Yeah, it's gonna be good. I don't think I can out sharp you though, Dave. Like, I'm gonna have to like go to. I'll, I'll have I know to this this t-shirt. This t-shirt. <laughs> you know, blue and black. It's hard. Will you, it's hard. Will you cut my hair before we go out at least? Of course. Of course. <laughs> I'll have my clippers on the road with me. That's that's the funny part. Amazing. That, that's, that would be such a great idea for a show, man. You should just go around cutting other bands' hair and like just having a podcast yeah. and chatting about it. Oh, dude, it'll be a buzz cut. It'll be a BuzzFeed show called Buzz Cut. There you go. It's gonna save BuzzFeed. That's it. I don't done. know. I don't know if they're doing well over there. Well, well, good luck with your new <laughs> venture and, and everything Thanks. else that's going on. And um yeah, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been awesome, Dave. Thank oh, you. Thanks, man. It was great to talk to you. Likewise. Take care, buddy. Thank you. All right, my man. Take care. Hi, dude. See ya. Congratulations on making it to the end of another episode of Tour Talk. You can keep up to date with us across the socials at Tour Talk Pod. So that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Patreon. Please subscribe, comment, like, and share. And we will see you next week.